The Walleye Creek Valley is Inner South West Sydney's environmental gem. A priceless 50 hectares of open space and bushland stretching from Bexley North to the Cooks River at Tempe. It's an irreplaceable resource for the South West and indeed Greater Sydney. And all the more so as the rapacious development industry pushes higher and higher densities onto the surrounding suburbs. The valley has only survived destruction by an eight-lane motorway through a David and Goliath struggle by community activists that stretched from the 1960s until the present day. The very fact that the 1948 County of Cumberland plan had designated the Walleye Valley as a future freeway route laid it open to degradation, but even in the 1960s, the locals had developed a reputation as a community that would stand up for the valley. A proposal to level Nanny Goat Hill for fill for a new airport runway was, for example, soundly defeated. This is the site where 400 Irwood residents are preparing their stand, with a thousand more backup troops from the Irwood Progress Association. Nanny Goat Hill, which some of the protesters climbed today to show me their battleground and to tell me their feelings. What, what, about, what about our children, my little elders? Some say the hill is a hideout for hoodlums and criminals, where the Kingsgrove slasher was caught, but the locals hotly deny this and prefer to talk about part of the film Jeddah being made here. The hill is a rugged outcrop of sandstone and tick bush, 200,000 cubic yards altogether, which the developers apparently reckon can be wiped from the landscape in nine months of blasting, bulldozing and trucking. But the Earlwood protesters not only say this is impossible, they're also concerned about losing one of the few beauty spots on the broad face of Sydney's western suburbs. They won that one, but the Walleye Freeway proposal was a higher order of threat. In 1983, the Walleye Creek and Bardwell Valley Preservation Society was formed to rev up opposition to construction of the F5 through the valley. I was recruited to the Preservation Society in 1986 by a workmate who'd grown up in the valley. Like others in the society, he wanted to inject new ideas, fresh blood and more community involvement into the organisation. But right from the get-go, we ran into suspicion and hostility. And it was a draft of this pamphlet that triggered a nasty internal struggle in the organisation. Almost all of the themes of the long years of struggle that followed are laid out in Walleye Creek What's the Fuss. The valley's unique status as a remnant of the pre-European landscape, Aboriginal occupation and pioneer settlement, and its irreplaceability for passive recreation and as a wildlife corridor. And it highlights the anti-freeway findings of the Kirby Inquiry, especially the need to rail containers out of Port Botany. The Society's committee was dominated by a couple who held all of the executive positions. The pamphlet we drafted aimed to mobilise the wider conservation movement behind the walleye struggle, but amazingly the two office bearers took it as evidence of a takeover by the pro-freeway Unsworth Labor government and the trucking industry. An attempt to expel me as the leader of this supposed conspiracy failed and the old executive resigned and founded a short-lived rival organisation, the Friends of Walleye Creek. After the split, the Preservation Society's activity surged ahead. Its legal status was strengthened by incorporation and the committee greatly expanded. A lively newsletter began to appear. Regular public walks introduced thousands to the valley. 
a photo and information display visited fairs and festivals, and an annual fundraising dinner was founded. There was huge enthusiasm for getting schools involved in using the valley for environmental education. I always secretly wondered whether we weren't wasting our time with marginal apolitical stuff, but the others were right. The kids introduced the valley to their parents, and as the long years passed, they grew up to be supporters. All this activity came just in time, because the 1988 state elections were rushing towards us. After the resignation of Neville Rann, the Labor government had been headed by the lacklustre Barry Unsworth, and he returned Labor to a full-on pro-freeway position. He pledged to build the F5 through the valley while somehow protecting what he called its environmental delicacy. By contrast, the Liberals, led by Nick Greiner, with Tim Moore as environment spokesperson, made lifting the freeway reservation a central plank of their campaign. Greiner came into office on something of a landslide, and Tim Moore, installed as Environment Minister, was happy to confirm the pledge to save the valley. Five months passed, and after some anxious prodding from the Preservation Society, Transport Minister Bruce Baird, Local MP Philip White and Tim Moore appeared in the valley and announced that it had duly been saved. News travelled fast and the Society's Committee assembled at the Chinese restaurant here in Bardwell Park for an impromptu victory celebration. And talk turned to the consolidation of the valley as a regional park. But it all turned out to be a cruel and cynical hoax. Within weeks, the Roads and Traffic Authority advanced a series of options for a new F5 route. And they repeated the dummy options trick they'd deployed years earlier at the Kirby Inquiry. There were options through Rockdale and Earlwood, which would have destroyed hundreds of homes. These were dummy options. They were just there to foster public hysteria and force a return to a route through the valley. Another dummy option was up there, a tunnel under the Earlwood Ridge Line. Certain that the RTA was just kidding about that one, the society decided to call their bluff. So we supported it. Under the slogan, if it goes in, it goes under. The other options were over here on an elevated structure above the railway, which was never going to happen. And then down here over the creek bed and through the bushland and that was the only one they were serious about. The RTA's manoeuvre created the climate for a quickly formed astroturf group called ERTAG to get up a petition in favour of the valley route. It even carried an authorisation line and address suggesting it was an official RTA document. The bulk of the signatories came from well outside the affected area. Caught in the middle, the hapless local Liberal MP, Phil White, told Parliament Ertag was conducting a fear and anxiety campaign bordering on public mischief. Of course, the government selected the Valley route. In dozens of meetings and newspaper stories, the Valley's defenders slugged it out with the RTA and Ertag from late 88 until an environmental impact statement for the F5 hit the deck in August 89. When our president went to the RTA to purchase a copy of the EIS, the lady at the counter asked whether she'd like the sub-consultant's reports as well. Thinking quickly, the president said she would. The RTA lady probably wasn't supposed to tell the public about those. The EIS itself, by Kin Hills, was a shocker. But it was the sub-consultant's reports that really gave the game away. These had been used to compile the environmental impact statement and they covered things like Aboriginal archaeology and impacts on air quality, flora and fauna, heritage, landscape and local noise. What we found was that the editors of the EIS had actually altered 
many of the findings of the subconsultants. Back in those days, the Environmental Impact and Assessment Act had not been declawed by successive governments and there were actually legal sanctions available, quite severe ones, for that sort of behaviour. And we recommended in our submission to the Environmental Impact Statement that legal proceedings should result against the editors of the EIS. Sensing public opinion running strongly against them, the RTA weighed in with a full page ad in the local papers. It was hilariously clumsy, full of errors of fact, loony assertions and outright obvious lies. There'd be more and better bushland, dramatically reduced air pollution, a clear unpolluted creek and nobody would notice the noise. They even promised playing fields where bulls won't get lost on the freeway. A record-breaking 6,000 submissions were received, the majority highly critical of or opposed to the freeway. 1990 arrived. Everybody expected that the Department of Planning would quickly approve the EIS and the RTA would rush to construction. But curiously, nothing happened for months. Was it that threat of legal action that broke the charge? We'll probably never know. The society didn't sit around waiting. While the EIS was still on the table, we'd launched our most creative project to date. Children from Earlwood Public School and Our Lady of Lords came together with composer John Shortest, artists and society activists to produce poems, stories, drawings and six wonderful songs about the valley. Somebody thought to enter the project for the Sir William McKell Award for Environmental Journalism. And to our astonishment, Eyes on Walleye won in the children's media category. An equally astonished Tim Moore handed over the award and a handy cheque. Sir William, former Labor Premier and Governor General, had reached out from the grave to help the fight. <laughs> The authorities' conduct of the F5 EIS and the findings of the Woodward inquiry into the F2 proposal threw the government into a deep crisis, and 200 community groups called for a royal commission into the RTA's operations. The RTA announced a supplementary EIS for the F5 and set up an advisory committee of community organisations to choose the tenderer for the task. The Preservation Society and the Cooks River Valley Association boycotted this group, but to the horror of the government and the RTA, it recommended the supplementary should be prepared by Jakarna, a consultancy with an established preference for public transport solutions. There was no way this would be allowed, and in a move straight from the Yes Minister playbook, Rhodes Minister Wal Murray announced an interdepartmental study team dominated by pro-road departments to identify transportation options for the region. In part four, we'll see how the fight against the F5 freeway led to the construction of the airport rail line and how the RTA was forced to abandon a surface route through the Walleye Valley.